Hi, welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Stephen E. Andrews, writer, critic, collector, bookseller. And today I'm going to talk about one of my favourite books of all time, a book which tragically I have never been able to sell in my career, which is now 38 years in as a bookseller, bookshop manager, copywriter, editor, what have you, all that time in the trade. I've only been able, able to sell this book once or twice and then in sort of print on demand editions which are not definitive as far as I'm concerned and also not the sort of handsome edition I wish I could sell. That book is Harlan Ellison's magnificent short story collection, The Beast That Shouted Love at the Heart of the World. As a novice reader of SF in the 1970s, I began by reading the obvious British writers who were predominant at that time still, and that time was the early 1970s, and the natural choices in that world, which wasn't dominated by SF imagery the way that the world has become since, remember that back in those days, if you caught on to science fiction through television and cinema, as most people have since the genre rose in 1925, it's grown contemporaneously with the literature. We've seen film, TV, what have you. So the two things are to a degree indistinguishable a time to some, though of course science fiction as a literary genre has lasted a lot longer and been around a lot longer than those new visual media. And I mean new in a sort of historical sense. So what did I look at? You know, there was Star Trek, there was a bit of Doctor Who, there were only three TV channels. If you were lucky, you'd see a 50s monster movie on a Saturday afternoon. If you were very lucky, you might see Forbidden Planet, something like that. But there was actually very little, so you had to go to books young if you wanted more SF, and that's what I did. And naturally, H.G. Wells was somebody I turned to, John Wyndham early on, because Wyndham only died in 66 when I was three years old. So by the time I was about seven or eight, he was still really, really famous in the UK. And and of course the golden age writers from America, the Asimovs, Heinleins, what have you, their fame had been growing steadily since their first paperbacks in the 1950s, their first hardcovers were in the 1950s, so they were still relatively new writers and even now those golden age figures are still really popular. I was lucky in the late 70s in that I stumbled upon the better quality literary SF writers from America and predominantly the names I would sort of conjure up. The early ones I read were Harlan Ellison, Alfred Bester and Philip K. Dick. Now even though I was aware of the work of Asimov and Heinlein and Herbert because they were everywhere, I didn't always like the look of them and I didn't try those writers until after I'd read Bester Ellison and Dick, who were superior in a literary sense, and there really isn't any question about that. You know, as stylists, as innovators, as masters of the short story form, they easily outstripped the more clunky prose stylists of the golden age. And that's not to disparage um, Asimov and Heinlein, they have their virtues. Frank Herbert was popular then as well. Um, Dune, my first attempt, I felt it was a big dumb book and didn't do it for me, but that's because by then I had read the most of the younger writers who came up in the 50s, Bester did go back to the golden age, Dick came up in the 50s, Alison in the late 50s, and these were people who grew up in a different time in SF when social satire was more of a thing, when magazines like um, Galaxy and the magazine of fantasy and science fiction were making stylistic leaps forward, satire in, in the Cold War, the 1960s, the New Wave period, which was influenced by people like Bester, Dick and Ellison, and Ellison participated in that, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I've always been very frustrated with Ellison's status, um, as I say, in my book selling career, because um, I revere his work. Um, I think he was very important. He's dead now, sadly. Um, I never got to meet him. He had a massive international reputation for being difficult. Um, he was hated as much as he was loved. And I have talked to people who met him and knew him and a writer I'm very friendly with, Christopher Priest, crossed swords with him, at least in print, but that's for another time. So I just really want to talk today about the book which I feel really is his endearing legacy and contains much of his best work. 
The sad thing, as I say, is because his work hasn't generally been available in mass market formats, certainly not in the UK since the 1970s, um, it's, it's not very well known. Also, because his novels are all from the early part of his career, and apart from a few sort of novella length things, his true novels, which really there are only two, I would say, are not SF, you know, they're, they're mainstream novels. Because Ellison didn't like to be regarded as a science fiction writer, he liked to be regarded more as a fantasist. Though the fact is, the work for which he will be remembered, the work for which he's won awards, and boy, he won a lot, he won over 70 awards for writing, a lot of them are screenwriting, mind you, but predominantly for his SF, and the SF that was produced in the mid to late 60s and early 1970s. He won lots of Hugos and Nebulas. And as I say, he wasn't writing novels then and he didn't really write novels after early on in his career. So we're talking about somebody who was more comfortable at short story, novelette and novella length. This is one reason why today Ellison is virtually unknown to readers under the age of 50 and why he's become an increasingly obscure figure. Now, he began his career in the late 50s he was a science fiction fan, um, he was very precocious, he ran away from home when he was very young, he was from a sort of Jewish upbringing, um, and one of those amazing talented Jews that we, that we have in SF, and we're so lucky to, to have had them. What, what is it? These guys just have it. You know, David Cronenberg, Barry N. Marsberg, Robert Silverberg, Avram Davidson, Harlan Ellison, fantastic. And they've contributed so much to the genre and have raised standards so much. We, we really must revere them. They've just done great work. And he did all sorts of jobs when he was young. And he followed Hemingway's dictum that you should write about what you know. So he did all sorts of things. And we can talk about that another time. But I really want to talk about this book, The Beast of Shadow, Love at the Heart of the World, as I say. But I need to put him into context because a lot of people will be unfamiliar with him. He started selling to magazines in the late 50s. He became the editor of a men's magazine called Rogue. He wrote juvenile delinquent stories. He wrote all sorts of things you know he's a jobbing writer but he was ambitious from the beginning and his SF really started to coalesce and come together at the end of the 50s he roomed or shared a house I think with Randall Garrett and Robert Silverberg at one point and there's been a kind of sort of friendly rivalry between the two throughout their careers and there is sort of a novella called All the Lies That Are My Life which you could argue highlights Silverberg and Ellison's sort of difference of relationships and career paths and what have you. Um, Silverberg luckily is still with us, which is which is a joy. Um, so Ellison then, he started to really rack up things in the 60s. He had a reputation for being quite hardcore and he famously dismissed um, Isaac Asimov at a convention. They they later became very good friends indeed and, um, and they loved each other very much, it was obvious. Um, but Ellison started to win lots of awards in the sort of mid to late 60s and he is mostly known now for editing an anthology called Dangerous Visions which was seen to be the spearhead of the new wave of SF in America and then there was a sequel anthology called Again Dangerous Visions and a famously controversial third volume which has never ever appeared which we will cover again called The Last Dangerous Visions. Ellison created Dangerous Visions and it was a massive bestseller huge selling anthology and he invited writers from the golden age right up to the most contemporary people in the new wave especially the new wave people associated in Britain like J.G. Ballard Americans who are in Britain like Thomas M. Dish to contribute stories and to write what editors of other magazines and book publishers wouldn't let them do. Now, New Wave in America was different to the UK. It was more about taboo breaking, introducing sort of leftist subjects. You have to remember this is 60s America. The times are different, civil rights, Vietnam War, psychedelic drugs, rock music, a lot of cultural and political changes, post-war economic boom, what have you. So that was the thing. So Alison was part of the generations growing up, sort of baby boomer um, and just before generations who were seeing social change. So he reflected a lot of the mores of the time. And Dangerous Visions and the award ring stories in that is very important. But that's the only thing you can easily get that Ellison's involved with now. And he has one story in there. I don't think it's a particularly important story. So I want to urge you to try and get out there and find a copy of this book as your first Ellison read. It's not easy to get. If you can get it, get this edition in pan 
or the Millington hardcover first edition there. There are US editions. At the end of the video, I'm going to list the complete contents because there have been revised editions which have added things. Also, some of those revised editions have been slightly tweaked and rewritten and they're not strong. And I think it's very important that you read the original stories in the original editions, which I'm going to talk about today, because the others can blunt the impact, in my opinion. And even if you get a new edition with the extra stories, leave those aside for another time. And you, you must read this as a piece. It's really important. I think I first read it, um, let me think, when was it? very end of the 70s, maybe around about 1980, 81. And I can't recall whether it was in my school library or whether my friend Phil, um, he read Alison before me. And I think we both had um, a book called The Illustrated Alison, which was short stories illustrated by different hands. Some of it was in 3D and, and illustrated by Steranko, the comic artist. And it sort of came with, um, with sort of stereoscopic shades. And I still have a copy of that book here somewhere. And I will get it out at some point and show it to you because that was my introduction to Alison. So I read short stories and they were very good indeed. And my friend Phil was a great comic sort of book artist and he became an animator later on. So he was my inroad into Alison really. But, um, and I'm very, very grateful to him. And also my father bought me a collection called The Time of the Eye, um, which he just picked up on one of his trips to Cardiff without knowing anything about Alison. He just bought it because it looked like the sort of thing I liked. And my dad had really good instincts and things like that. He bought me my first bester as well. So um, sadly, he's no longer with us either. But, um, you know, so I owe a lot to um, to both my father and my friend Phil for that. So it's really important stuff. So um, I think this is the actual copy that I bought at the time. And as you see, it's a panel lozenge. It's very beautiful and um, really lurid cover. This is my preferred edition. The Millington has the same text, if you can pick that up too. And the early American editions will as well. I think once you get past about the mid 80s, sometimes it's additional things to so try and avoid them. Why is this book so important? Well, really, um, I have to go through every single story to tell you why. But before I do that, for one story alone, this is really important. And that story is called A Boy and His Dog. It's the final one in the volume. It was made into a film of the same name in 1975. It won the Nebula Award. It was first published in the UK in the late 60s in New Worlds magazine. It was one of three stories that won the Nebula in the late 60s that was published in New Worlds. New Worlds was then edited by Michael Moorcock. The other two stories were Moorcock's own Behold the Man, the short version, not the novel length version, which came later. The other one was Time Considered as a Helix of Semi-Precious Stones by Samuel R. Delaney, which is in most of the early Delaney collections. It's in Drift Glass and it's in I and Gomorrah as well. And you'll find it as in Shatter, I think it's in Shatter Shards. Um, it's in most of the early Delaney collections as well. So those are three really important stories, which between them kind of sum up the revolutionary attitude of New Wave, which was going to shake things up, was going to bring a more literary thing in, and was going to sort of push the old fuddy duddies aside, and it did. So anyway, A Boy and His Dog, the finest post-apocalyptic story that you will ever read, bar none, Better Than The Road by Cormac McCarthy. That's the best post-apocalyptic novel. And by post-apocalyptic in this sense, I mean after the bomb. So post-atomic is what we're talking about. So Ellison, as I say, he did all sorts of writing things. He got quite wealthy and did really well in the 60s because he was a screenwriter. He wrote a lot of things for TV, like Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Um, he wrote the various series, Alfred Hitchcock things. Um, one of his stories called Soldier, was filmed for The Outer Limits um, and another one called Demon with a Glass at Hand was also filmed for The Outer Limits. They're two of the best episodes. If you combine the plots of those two stories, you effectively have Terminator. And, you know, I'll do a video about this and I'm amazed that a lot of people still don't know about this, but I guess it's because a lot of Terminator fans don't read much SF. But um, there was a settlement out of court and I think Ellison received $75,000 because he wasn't credited um, for the borrowing of the sources. And he said himself, if Cameron had asked me, I'd have said, yeah, that's fine. And prints of the Terminator after a certain date have an Ellison credit in them towards the end. So you can see that there. So, you know, he was an important one. In interestingly, Demon with a Glass Hand was filmed in the big wet apartment building, um, which is in the climax of 
Blade Runner, where J.F. Sebastian lives and where Roy Batty and Rick Deckard have their final confrontation. So that building has a kind of SF history. So there you go. So the Beast of Shouted Love at the Heart of the World. I'm going to talk about it story by story. And the thing with Ellison, he was a great self-publicist and, you know, a genius showman. Now, Christopher Priest has said that um, in his writings about Ellison, that he was a writer, really, whose reputation stood on a handful of sensationalist short stories. And I, I can see how Chris arrived at this, because there's a certain element of truth in it. Um, but the sensationalist short stories are, quite frankly, sensational. They're powerful. They're sharp. They slice through everything else. The, the writing is beautiful um, and you never forget them. And, you know, they are just amazing stories. So because he was such a good self-publicist, something that he did was he would write an introduction to each volume. And when he did Dangerous Visions, he wrote an introduction and an afterword to each story. And I have to say, for me, a lot of those introductions and afterwards are better than some of the stories themselves, because he was a really good non-fiction writer. He was a good journalist. He wrote about films and all sorts of stuff. He wrote really well. He wrote great essays in a very strong moral sense. Um, you know, even though some people have cast sort of aspersions upon that, but that's for another time. So this opens up with the title story, The Beast That Shouted Love at the Heart of the World. After a wonderful introduction called The Waves at Rio, which is just just great. And I'll read a little bit of that to give you a sort of feel. Standing in the hotel window, staring down at the Atlantic Ocean, night crashing into the Cocabana beach, down in Brazil on a fool's mission, talking to myself. Standing in the window of a stranger who I suddenly know well, while down in Avinda Atlantica in another window, one I know well who has suddenly become a stranger. So, you know, you've got this very poetic sort of prose. And then the first story, the title story, is quite surrealistic. It flips from one thing to another. It begins with the chronicle of a man who goes round his neighbour's doors and he puts strychnine or some of the poison, I think it's a poison out of um, sort of weed killer, into the bottles of milk that have been delivered and loads of them die. And, you know, he then goes around shouting, I love everybody. And it goes on from there. And it's a very experimental story. It's only 18 pages long. And it has this wonderful evocative title, The Beast of Shouted Love at the Heart of the World. And it's sort of fairly, it's not typical because new wave stories aren't typical. That was the point of them. They took the techniques from literary modernism and meshed them with the raw energy and the tropes of SF, which is why they were so revolutionary. And they reflected the sort of psychedelic times they were in. And it's a great opener because you really do think, wow. And Ellison's one of those people who, when you present a story like this to a mainstream reader, they just think, cripes, this guy is really quite something, you know. So the second story in the book is called Phoenix. And I've referred to Phoenix in my video on, um, I think it's in Conceptual Breakthrough. And it's a great story about exploration, about a jilted lover who goes with his ex-lover and her new man who is rich and soft and pampered on a desert expedition to an archaeological site. And I'll tell you no more than that, but Phoenix is an absolutely fantastic story. It really, really is. And then I've read these stories so many times, you know, some of them, I couldn't quote them, you know, word for word, but bits of them just leap out at me. And I go back this book and I reread it regularly and I read individual stories. Then the story that comes after that is called Asleep with Still Hands. And that's an amazing story set in the future, which is about um, a future where there's been no wars for 600 years. Because there's been no wars, technical innovation has stopped and mankind has atrophied, become decadent, and there isn't any progress anymore. And it's about two sort of philosophers come warriors who decide that the only way that we can get mankind moving again is to start a war. Unfortunately, there is a being, a man, who is asleep, wired to a computer, whose dreams prevent war happening. I won't go into detail about that because it's fascinating. But these two guys, they form these mercenary factions to try and start a war, but they have to circumvent the dreamer's ability to prevent war. 
and Asleep with Still Hands. What a magnificent story. And it's pure SF. It's got the raw energy, the amphetamine rush. It's sharp imagery. There isn't a word wasted, the eloquence, and there are sudden flashes of violence and horror and color. And, you know, Ellison is just the master. These are really exciting narratives. For those of you who think like a 600 page or 1000 page book by Peter F. Hamilton is exciting, Think again, the art of the short story is the very essence of the greatest, the greatest genre SF is more often to be found in the short stories which came out in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Some of the finest work by the finest writers is in the short form. So that's a really great one as well. Looking through and, you know, the urge for me to just stop talking and just get reading is too much here. And there's another experimental story, a short one called the Pittle Poab, Divi the Pittle Poab Division, which I struggle with even now. It's very short. It's very surreal. It's set on an alien world with aliens who are experimenting on a human being. The words Pittle Poab come up in a Incredible Hulk saga that Ellison wrote for the Incredible Hulk, the comic back in the 70s. Um, and that was the story where the Hulk is shrunk down and he follows a girl to a subatomic world. And those are great stories. They really, really are. And marvellous, marvellous stuff. There's also Worlds to Kill. Worlds to Kill. Oh, man, Worlds to Kill. That's such a great one. And Worlds to Kill is, again, about war. And it is about somebody who sets themselves up in a future interstellar sort of civilization to spark wars, to sort of deal with revenge and issues like that and they're absolutely great and there are beings with squid heads and what have you and it's got all the sort of classic stuff that would look great on a magazine cover from the 50s or 60s and wills to kill them. brilliant brilliant stuff really good um there's try a dull knife which is mostly set in a latin american nightclub and a man who's been stabbed in an alley making his way into the gents bathroom where he's bleeding out but there is a kind of science fictional supernatural element to it all and it's full of latin flavor and color and mexican sort of terms and um, bits from hispanic language and it's just try a dull knife and it's it's sharp that knife it cuts you know it's sort of you, you bleed out in that story you bleed out in all these stories they they don't leave you unaffected they're very powerful and yeah maybe they're sensationalistic but boy they still they're still exciting to me and when I first read these I was you know about 15 16 and even now at the age of 59 they still thrill me marvelous stuff white on white is a story about um, I would say I would say cryptozoology is what white on white is about um, but you know with a difference it's a cryptozoology story it's probably the weakest story in here it's only about five pages but it's still fantastic a lot of these appeared in magazines and things over a period of a few years because Alison is the same as a short story writer and the collections will be put together later some of them will pop up in other collections as well then there's a wonderful story called um, Are You Listening which is obviously to me influenced by Alfred Bester and it reminds me of the tone of best of stories like the ones in the dark side of the earth um which you know have got this sort of wonderful folksy tricksy sort of late 50s cool feeling about them absolutely fantastic um really really great and you know there's not many stories in here this is the thing let me count them up there are 12 and you know 12 you know any more than that is too much and a wonderful funny story called Santa Claus versus Spider which is a sort of James Bond spoof you know the James Bond films were new in the 60s and they soon were getting parodied with Austin Powers type things you were getting Our Man Flint those sort of things and Santa Claus versus Spider is about a spy assassin type figure who you know um uses sort of christmas as a cover and he's got these little elves working for him and things and it sounds very twinky but it's actually quite hardcore and quite naughty at times and santa claus versus spiders getting spider are these aliens who look like spiders and they're small and they've taken over lots of people on earth they've gone into sort of um president's heads through their ears and stuff like that and lots of real people are named in that story and um 
Chris, the, the central character, who is the Santa Claus figure, he goes after Spider and he's one of a network of spies to seek out these aliens and get them out of the heads of our leaders. And, you know, it satirizes people like Spiro Agnew and these sort of like American Republican figures, those sort of things as well. And it's really funny. It's a great story. It really, really is. And um, so it's a, it's like a satire of a satire. It satirizes the satires and parodies of James Bond. And it also satirizes the behavior of sort of conventional political figures in America at that time, which is great stuff. So that's when you probably enjoy more if you know that sort of thing. But when I read this, I had no idea who Spiro Agnew was. No, I didn't know who these people were. But, you know, this is the thing. Great literature educates you, gets you looking. You don't know the references, you look them up. It was hard to look them up then. Now, what you've got to do is look on Google. So you've got no excuses, kids. So just look stuff up. If you don't know what it means, look it up and then it'll enlighten you. You'll enjoy things more. So that's a funny one. And I guess um, there's another favorite here and this this i mean there are certain stories in this i mean four or five of them are i mean they're all great but it's four or five which are just masterpieces run for the stars is part of ellison's kyben sequence um the kyben are a race of humanoid gold-skinned beautiful aliens with tentacular hands who come to earth and have invaded earth and they are war with earth and they're going to destroy us and they are utterly without any qualms whatsoever and they pop up in several ellison stories in the late 50s on and demon with a glass hand from the outer limits is actually a kyben story and um, there are people there are kyben in that story and in this story they've come to earth the invasion's underway things are not really really not going well and the authorities of earth are you know desperate and they pick up a, an addict a drug addict and they give him a mission and if he doesn't and it's interesting because the way that they give him this mission to undermine the kyben and destroy them is quite ruthless when you read it you do think of the bits in terminator about um john connor selecting michael bean's character and sending sending him back into the past the sacrifice what have you you also see a similar thing what they've done to him is rather similar to what um happens in Neuromancer where Armitage um, who is of course representing Wintermute in Neuromancer um, where Armitage you know puts the um, the mycotoxin sacs in um, in Casey's stomach and they're going to dissolve and he's going to lose his um, cyberspace ability again so it's a similar thing to that so you can see Alison's influence not only over film but also over cyberpunk writing as well and Alison isn't mentioned enough when you come to cyberpunk because he was a punk before anybody he had bags of attitude hardcore and I mentioned his early work and he ran with a street gang in Brooklyn called the Barons he pretended to be younger than he was because he's quite a little guy. He's only about five foot five, five foot four. And he pretended to be younger. He wore a leather jacket. He went, underwent an initiation ceremony and he entered that whole sort of um, New York street gang thing, which you get in West Side Story. Of course, there was no singing and dancing. It was all knives and zip guns. And he um, wrote a novel based on that experience called Web of the City. It was originally entitled Rumble. And he wrote a non-fiction book about the aftermath of that called Memos from Purgatory, which is fantastic. And part of that was actually filmed for an Alfred Hitchcock show, I seem to recall. Never actually seen it, but the books I've read many times and they're really great. So he had that street punk attitude, that counterculture young attitude from the beginning. And that spreads through. So Ellison was somebody, <clears throat> the people like Sterling and Gibson and, you know, everybody read you know he was hugely successful as i say so that is all there in um run for the stars and it's got a shocking denouement ending fantastic novella really really great so that's a good one then um what another favorite of mine is a story which is 10 or 11 pages long called sro and um, when i read this i didn't know for years what sro meant it means standing room only of course and it's something that is applied to live performances you would go along there's a time before there were more fire eggs and you wouldn't get a seat they say a standing room only you can go in but you know you've got to stand and obviously you've got to rock and roll gigs or have a lot of people standing so standing room only and it's about um one day this interdimensional or starship just appears in new york 
um, this array of bizarre aliens who are all different shapes come out. They don't communicate and they just start moving and they're doing, it's recognised that they're doing the performance and it's about a guy who's like a theatrical agent and he starts charging tickets and things. It's a classic 50s SF thing and it's got a wonderful, uh, wonderful ending. SRO, standing room only, brilliant. And then we come to a boy and his dog. Well, what can I say about a boy and his dog? There are two types of people in the world. There are the people who have read A Boy and His Dog and there are the people who haven't. And the people who haven't should all read it. Now, it was quite controversial at the time. And what was more controversial was the way it was filmed by L.Q. Jones, who was a character actor who did lots of work with Sam, Sam Peckinpah. He also wrote the screenplay. Um, the film is uneven. It's got some great stuff in it. It's got a few sort of fails in it, but I'll talk about that another time. But the story itself, it's set in... Let me see, I think it's 2024. I'm just going to consult this. And of course, this was written in the late 60s. Um, and it's the longest story in the book. So let me just pin it down. Um, and let's see, 178. So it's about 35 to 40 pages long. And it's set after World War Three, or even World War Four gets mentioned um, in the film. And it's set in the ruins of North America, which has been bombed flat. The world has been completely annihilated by nuclear war. There are some survivors. They are mostly either solos, young, single men who are out in the wasteland looking for food and trying to eke out survival in this blasted land, this blighted place, which is now North America. Or they are rover packs where gangs have come together for sort of mutual shared skills and for protection. So there's two things. And the solos have a distinct advantage because the solos are accompanied by dogs. And if you look at the picture here, I mean, that looks more like a cat, but um, the, <laughs> the, the story is narrated by Vic, um, who is a young solo. He is a teenager, 16 or 18. Um, he has never really known his parents. He's grown up in the wasteland. It's depopulated. And he is with this dog and the dog is called Blood. Now, Solos and their dogs have an interesting relationship. And this is really what the song Diamond Dogs by David Bowie is about. It's nothing to do with 1984, anything like that. It's about a boy and his dogs. Boy and his dog is a very successful story and, and widely anthologized. So the dogs are telepathic. Blood is a telepath. The dogs in the world of a boy and his dog are survivors, descendants of genetically engineered, vivisected dogs who were built for telepathic ability. They had spinal injections of fluid from chakma baboons and dolphins and what have you, gene splicing, selective breeding. And they were used extensively in what is called in the narrative, the Third War. So this is set after World War Four. The Third War, the Third World War is a conventional war, but it also used lots of chemical weapons, gas and that sort of thing. So it was something which obviously put lots of mutagens into the environment. And this is all before Vic is, is born. And Bled, the dog, is can read, and he's pretty much he's pretty much more intelligent than Vic. His young sort of, he's, he's not an owner, they're a team, they're a symbiotic team, they're a boy and his dog. And in the wasteland, they are seeking out food, they are seeking out shelter, um, and also Vic is preoccupied with sex, being a young man. You know, he's, he's, um, he's got the mojo working. And there aren't many women around. Um, and in this world, there are things called down-unders. There are cities. People have gone underground into bunkers, presumably during the Third War and before World War Four got going and flattened everything. And there are underground cities called down-unders, a bit like the ones in um, The Penultimate Truth by um, Philip K. Dick. And... They're sort of bourgeois stratified societies, they're sort of white bread, you know, conventional mom pop sort of things. And, you know, all the civilized people or the repressed people, as, as Vic would have it, because he is a bit of a punk. And this is the thing. Halloween Jack, Halloween Jack in the David Bowie song Diamond Dogs is based on Vic. He's more like Alex from A Clockwork Orange than anything else. And the down unders are there, but the solos and their dogs are out there. Sometimes they do deals with the rover packs and there's a rover pack who live 
who lives near Vic, and you get the feeling this is Greater New York, New Jersey, what have you. And they um, they've got an old projector and a few old films, and they do a cinema service. And you go along the cinema, and you have to leave your guns at the door because this is survivalist city. This is the greatest of all survivalist narratives, the most fierce one, the most savage and uncompromising one. Pulls no punches. And Vic and Blood go along to watch some films, and they see an old James Cagney film. They see a film made during the Third War, um, which shows skirmisher dogs, Blood's ancestors, um, attacking what, um, what, what Blood calls a chink town. So obviously that's a racist term. They're talking about some war with the East, with the Chinese maybe, or some sort of Asian Federation. Because of course, in the 1960s, there was sort of standoffs, not just between um, Soviet Russia and the USSR, and you know capitalist america was also the chinese thing as well with mao and everything so it sort of reflects those times as well in vietnam and it sounds very ugly and then they see a um a stag movie called big black beaver splits and that's described as well and it sounds quite hairy as um as vic says and then bled telepathically communicates to vic there is a girl in this crowd dressed as a man and first of all, Vic doesn't have it, but he then realizes that Blood is always right. Because Blood is always trying to educate Vic because he's illiterate and, he, and Blood has, has taught Vic to read. So that if he finds a sort of a load of buried cans under a collapsed supermarket, he knows what's beetroot and he knows what isn't, and he knows what's beans, that sort of thing. So the pair go off in search of this girl because, quite frankly, there's only one way to put it. Um, in this world, he's so savage and and horrible that relationships between men and women come down to one thing they come down to rape and this is where this is a very sort of controversial narrative so Vic then goes after um, the disguised girl blood goes with her and they track her down um, they capture her and he and she's taken to this underground gymnasium and I'm gonna stop there because I've given you a feel of it and it goes on from there. There's a very powerful ending and it doesn't pull any punches at all. And it's about the love of a boy and his dog. And it's regarded by many feminists as a dreadful sort of narrative. But what it's really about is the tragedy of juvenile delinquency and the nobility of the dog as, as a companion. And it's, it's a wonderful story. Um, it's about the unconditional love between a boy and his dog. Um, and it sort of shows the sort of dreadful world we could end up with if there was a nuclear apocalypse. And it's just terrible. And it's massively inventive, um, beautifully written. So he pulls no punches. So a boy and his dog. It's one of the finest genre science fiction stories I've ever read. And it's not pleasant, but you know, does anybody really expect a post-nuclear world to be pleasant? Um, it's got strong moral messages and really, you know, it's it's a warning. It's, you know, people say, oh, science fiction isn't prophecy. It isn't a warning or whatever. Ellison's writing was polemical. He believed in trying to get across moral points. He would stick to his moral points. He was sometimes accused of being a hypocrite. And again, we'll talk about that again, as I say. And I want to talk about Ellison a lot because he's a figure I really revere. And I think his best stuff is amongst the finest genre fiction I've ever read. This is in my top two collections of science fiction stories um, ever. This and The Dark Side of the Earth Bar for Best. I've also done a video about that. These to me represent the very pinnacle of genre SF, which is on the edge of literature or maybe is literature. I think it is. I think the best there is. Um, if only there were material like this being produced now. Um, I'll talk a lot more about Ellison if you've not read him before. Try and track this one down. And at the end of the video, I'm going to list the exact contents of the preferred editions. And I would urge you not to buy recent editions. Ellison's dead. He doesn't need your royalties. He's passed on, sadly. I wish I'd met him. You know, I really revered him. But, you know, read the original versions um, with the original context. If you enjoyed that, please like, subscribe, comment. There'll be more Alison. There's more Silverberg coming soon. Lots of other stuff. Um, over the next couple of months, November, December, I hope to be doing a lot more new wave things, British and American, because that's the thing I really love and the demand's building up. And there's not a lot of great new wave material out there on YouTube, you know, and I'm not sort of fest on space opera and that sort of thing a lot of the time. There'll be more book hauls, collected diaries, what have you. But anyway, 
get out there and try and get an early copy of The Beast That Shouted Love at the Heart of the World. You love it. Bye for now.